here at Enid Creek Church. And as we get started this evening, uh, let me make a few announcements before we go to the Lord in prayer. Of course, uh, there's not really a lot of things. We are, we're coming to an end to the summer. Do y'all know that next Friday, I know Edward County does, the kids go back to school next Friday. Yes. I believe that's right. Yes. So, so uh, the, parents, yes. the parents is probably shouting and the kids is crying. Amen. So uh, don't forget about that. We're going to have, it probably won't be this Sunday. Probably the Sunday after because we've got a baptism. We may do pizza that night of our baptism, which will be on August the 4th. So uh, we'll give you an update on that for sure coming Sunday. But I was going to do something like that for our kids before they went, went after right when they go back to school. Yes, ma'am. I have put some books um, on the corner. If you are interested in being adopted, the adopted child, there's lots of beautiful, beautiful children from, I guess, with the names and anything, if you are interested, there's a pallet book there, and I can update them every three months, they say. Take them home with you, enjoy them, and if you find one you like, come talk to them. And go to the <laughs> Zach, you are good for You can start when you need to <laughs>
Sister Louise and I give you Sister Carol. I remember Deanne. Deanne Sandlin, that's right. Deanne Sandlin, she just started on dialysis. Continue to remember her, Carol. Have you heard from Norma Faye? Norma Faye was here Sunday or Sunday night. I know I talked to her Sunday. She herself fell, and she had a been getting in the back with again, but she fell and had a black eye, so people remember Sister Sister Nama face. So they had several. Be remembering, be remembering this this one and also Sister Leslie. Sister Leslie. I've i never noticed if something happened, it rained when it when it rained it poured. Amen. But Sister Leslie uh, King had her gallbladder out this past past week and she's been having a lot of issues with that also. Please be remembering her. So there are just several people that in our church and that need to be lifted up in prayer. Amen. I encourage you. If you do know these folks uh, or pick up that directory or through Facebook some way to contact them and say, hey, we're praying for you. We miss you at church. And just lift them up. I mean, it means a lot when you just contact somebody and they, they let you know that you're thinking about them. Amen. As we get started, why don't we stand up this evening? And we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to take all of these needs to a great God. Amen? Amen. And we're going to lay them at His feet. And we're going to ask Him to have His will and His way. We know He's more than able to meet these needs. Brother Wayne, come on and open this up as you do on Wednesday night. Open this up in prayer. Let's pray. Father God, you've heard every request, God, and every, every need that we've brought to the, to the foot of the cross tonight, God. Father, you know the ones that are hurting ones that are sick, God. But I know, God, and these people know that we serve a big God. Amen. He's powerful. You're powerful, God, and there's nothing that, that you can't do. So, Father, we bind together all of our faith, all of us together. That's right. Our faith yes. binds together, God, as we lift all these people up in prayer. Holy Spirit, do what you do. God, just Go to those hospital rooms and those homes and wherever they're at, God, and just uh, just minister to them. Let them know that they're loved, God, and that, that healing is, is on the way and, and it's available. I thank you, Father, for this congregation tonight, God. I pray that, that we will be free in our worship, God, yes. that we will just uh, give you our honor. We thank you for Jesus. It's his name we pray. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. I was alone and out. I was a sinner too. I heard voices from heaven saying, "There's work to do." I threw my master's hand and I pulled that heavy band. Now I'm on the battlefield, my Lord. Thank you. 
to do that as we live our daily lives. And tonight I'm going to move on into the third chapter and I also want to read into the fourth chapter. And we're going to be preaching on this, persecuted for Christ. Persecuted for Christ. Um, we may not relate to this as, as much as other countries, but I want to share this with you. And I want to share with you some things that's going on in the world that you may not know that is going on in the world. Um, we may think that, uh, that Christians don't suffer as they did in the first century, that, but that would be far from the truth that there are many Christians around this world right now in 2019 that are suffering greatly for the cause of Jesus Christ. And, and we need to be mindful of that and never forsake what is going on to our brothers and sisters in Christ and around the world. But if you've got your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 3 and beginning in verse 13. Amen. I'll give them just another second to finish with those notes there. And please, as I said a moment ago as we started the service, if you know any of these that are sick, please pick up that phone and call them. Go by and see them, whatever it, the case may be. You can hand them right here, bro. Um, anybody, everybody got a, a note? Everybody got some notes? I try and do notes on Wednesday night because I figured y'all were sleepy. And uh, y'all been working all day, everybody except Danny yeah. been working all day, amen. <laughs> and uh, but everybody, I like to pick on Danny, amen. Y'all pray for him. Tomorrow he's going on a cruise tomorrow, him and Rosie and their grandchildren. Let's pray that the boat don't sink, amen. <laughs> pray he gets back safe, amen. <laughs> amen. But y'all be remembering them that's going on vacation and those that have been and these that are sick, please lift them up in prayer. But if you've got your Bibles, beginning in 1 Peter chapter 3, we'll begin in verse 13. If you're there, say amen. amen. It says this, suffering for right and wrong, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteous sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God, sanctify Christ in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you the reason for your hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that with when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing good. Evil. All right, now let's skip over to chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. Suffering for God's glory. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials which is to try you, as though some strange thing is happening to you. He said, this is not strange. This is not out of place, the things that you're going through. But he says in verse 13, but rejoice to the extent that you partake in Christ's suffering. So here again, we see that this epistle was directed towards suffering Christians. And he says, look, this is not out of place. He said, remember that Christ also suffered. Yes. Listen to me right now. Christ suffered, but Christ didn't do all the suffering. The, the gospel, the very price of salvation was paid by the precious blood of Jesus. He yes. suffered for it, that he may purchase our salvation. But in order for this gospel to go forth, there will also incur suffering, amen, of the messengers. We need to understand that. And it goes on to say that we can rejoice in the extent that you partake in Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. We have something to look forward to. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, he said. He goes on, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you on their part. He is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as murderers. If you're going to suffer, he said, don't suffer for being a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a busybody. Mm. In other people's matters, we don't have any of those in here tonight, do we? We don't have any nosies in here or busybodies, I know. He said, you shouldn't be getting in trouble for being any of these things, he says. But he goes on to say, if, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. In other words, be proud, be thankful that we have the opportunity to suffer for the name of Christ. 
verse 17 and say, or I'll stop right there. I'll stop right there with the reading of the Word. And let's pray over the reading of God's Word uh, this evening as we dig into this tonight. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and once again, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house. I thank you for our, our musicians and Brother Wayne leading us in worship. I thank you for all of these wonderful folks that are here tonight. I thank you for all of the young people and the children that are upstairs and in their classrooms. And we pray right now over them, God, that you bless their classes, bless what is going forth and what's happening right now. May the word go forth and touch their hearts and mold them and shape them and direct them uh, towards you. We pray, God, over this service and the remainder of this service right now. Thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for your word, God, that is enduring, that is powerful, that is strong, God, that stands forever, Lord. Thank you, God, that we may stand upon it and hold firm to it. And, Father, we pray tonight that you'd help me to preach this word and to share this message as you have laid it upon our hearts, God. May you give us a burden, God, to lift up those that are being persecuted right now for your name's sake. May, God, you encourage us also to be prepared for when we ourselves face persecution, Lord. We thank you tonight, Jesus. We ask you to bless this uh, service and bless this preaching in the name of Jesus. And ask for your help. And everybody said, Amen, amen and Amen. Um, if you remember, I talked a little bit about this in the first sermon that we preached from 1 Peter. And I talked about how this epistle was directed and it was written towards suffering first century Christians. Those that were being persecuted. And we see that from the very first chapter in verse 1. I don't know if I told a man to put verse 1 of chapter 1 on there. But it says this to the pilgrims of the dispersion. It says in chapter 1, verse 1, you can just flip right over there in your Bible, to those that are in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, Peter is writing, he is directing this epistle to the elect of God, to the brothers in Christ that have been scattered throughout what we know as modern-day Turkey. Well, why were they scattered? Why was the church, why were believers scattered? Very simply is because of persecution. That's why they were scattered. What is amazing, and I'll throw this in there as I'm beginning this, they thought that persecution was going to snuff out the church. They thought that by uh, uh, being uh, doing evil towards believers and persecuting them, they thought that they would eradicate Christ from the face of the earth. But actually what they did was put gasoline on a fire and it exploded out from Israel to through Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the other parts of the earth. And that's what we're seeing here, that this first century church had been persecuted and they were spreading, they were spreading north and moving into what we know as modern day Turkey. Now, we, I want to share with you just a little bit of the things that they faced and some of the ways that they endured persecution, how they were maligned, how they were martyred. And I, and I got into this a little bit deeper the very first sermon I preached on this, and I really talked about how they were martyred. Let me just tell you a few ways in which Christians were treated in the first century, especially by the Romans. This is on your piece of paper. Did you know this, that Christians were considered atheists? Atheists. Why? The Romans looked at them and considered them to be atheists. Why? Because the Romans had all kinds of idol gods in their homes. These little idols that they could see, that they could pray and do. Not only that, but they believed that the emperor, the emperor of Rome was a god. But the thing about Christians were, they refused to worship these idols. They refused to worship the emperor, and therefore they saw them as atheists. Number two, Christians held illegal private meetings because public meetings were forbidden. Romans looked at these Christians as subverts of, of Rome. They looked at them as troublemakers, that they're trying to start some type of rebellion in Rome, and they treated them that way because of these secret meetings in which they held uh, and secret services. Number three, Christians spoke of another king and another kingdom. That, I told you many of that emperor was considered God. There was nobody higher. But yet Christians were talking of another king and another kingdom. It was considered treason to them. And some 50 years after, after Apostle Peter lived, Christianity was a capital offense. Number four, Christians 
held dinners uh, for the purpose of sharing Christian love and fellowship, very similar to the way that we do. There ought to be a love, a lot of love in this church because there's a lot of eating that goes on in this church. Amen. Amen. That goes all the way back to first century Christians, if you didn't know that. They would meet in their homes and they would eat together and they fellowship together. That would be makings in the beginning of the church. And they were called, the Bible even says this, they were called love feasts. Love feasts. Well, the Romans criticized them. They mocked them and uh, slandered them by saying that they were sexual orgies going on. They were perverted. They were perverts and deviants because of this. Number five, Christians observed communion in which they ate unleavened bread in which they drank of wine. That wine was symbolic of what? God's blood or Christ's blood. And it, the bread was his body. They, the Romans accused Christians of being participating in cannibalism. Six Christians have preached about hellfire and brimstone. And I, I brought this out in detail, the first sermon I preached in first peak, uh, sermon, and how Nero, when he burned 11 of the 12 sections of Rome to the ground, he was, it was very easy for him to blame it on the Christians because they preached of hellfire and brimstone. Amen. These are just a few things. I didn't go into the detail of the martyrism. I've done that a few weeks ago. These are some of the ways that they were slandered, that they were hated, that they were judged, they were ostracized because of who they were and what they believed, and it only escalated from there. But this is the point that I want to bring tonight, that that hatred that we read about and we study about from history in the first century church, it did not end in the first century. But that hatred today for Christians is just as real as it was almost 2,000 years ago. We may be here in America and we're in our little bubble today and we are blessed with religious freedoms. But the fact of it is, Christians are being persecuted all around the world right now as we speak. Amen. And I want to share with you a few facts uh, that I looked out. This report just came out recently, and, and you can go and read a little bit more about this. It is what I'm going to share with you comes from Open Doors USA. Open Doors USA, and they have been doing this for 60 years. 60 years they have been working with some of the most oppressive and restrictive countries for Christians all around the world. And see, the thing of it is, today is just like in the book of Acts, Christians are persecuted all over the world. Christians remain some of the most persecuted, Christians remain one of the most persecuted uh, religious groups in all the world. Do you know that it covers up to 60 countries? Over six, in 60 countries, Christians are persecuted for their faith. And Open Doors, USA, they say that this number has gone up. 14% in since 2018, just this year. It's gone up 14%. Now, I read an article come out this week. News, it was on Newsweek and it was at several other places. And it's mentioned that some of these places are reaching genocide levels. Look at the, some of these facts on here. I'm going to get to the preaching in a minute after the teaching, all right? Just hold on with me. Don't fall asleep yet. <laughs> 245 million, 245 million. That is very close to the population of the United States. We've got, well, we've probably got 320 million, I think, somewhere in there now. But there's 245 million Christians experience high levels of persecution in the countries on this world watch list. That's their list. That is up, that's 2019 numbers, that's up from 2018, which was 215 million. That means that one in nine Christians experience high levels of persecution worldwide. They have what is known as the World Watch List, and they rank countries on there based by how they persecute Christians. And the top ten are these, North Korea. The second one is Afghanistan. Somalia, Libya, Pakistan, Sudan, Eritrea, I can't say that one, Yemen, Iran, and India. Now, out of those ten, out of those ten, is Islamic oppression fuels eight out of the ten. In other words, the only, ten, the only ones on that list that are not 
um, Islamic persecution of Christians is only North Korea and India. All those other eight are where Christians are persecuted by the Muslim faith. What amazes me, what amazes me that we have people in our Congress today that want to back the Muslim faith. It amazes me that they can flee from other countries that are Muslim uh, based and then come over here and tell us how wonderful that the religion of Islam is. Amen? Don't you dare be fooled by that garbage and that lie. Amen? Amen. Eight out of the ten worst countries that oppress Christians are Islam or Muslim based. We are not friends with Muslims. We are the infidels to them. Let me tell you this too. We do not serve the same God that they serve in. They like to push that story. The Pope and some Muslim high class leader met and they got together. This is made the news not too long ago and they talked about how that we're just serving the same God. Allah and God Almighty is the same one. Let me tell you something. That is a lie out of a pit of hell tonight and don't you dare believe it. Amen. Maybe nobody else will preach this and tell you this, but at least these 75 in here tonight are going to know it. Amen? Amen? I tell you tonight, we've got to understand that. Look at these other numbers. I want to preach. I want to move on and preach. Every month, on average, now they've been collecting numbers for 60 years now studying this. They say that 345 Christians are killed for faith-related reasons every month. 105 churches and buildings are burned or attacked every month. 219 Christians on average are detained without trial. They're arrested, sentenced, and imprisoned. All of this. And the thing of it is, they, they're saying and they're stressing this on, on more than one side as I was looking this up, is that Christian persecution is on the rise. In the two largest countries in the world, the two largest countries, that's China and India, there are over a billion people in China. There's over a billion people in India. That is, in both of the, China alone is, in population is almost three times larger than the United States. India itself, in population, the number of people is almost three times larger itself than the United States. It gives you any idea the amount of people that are in these countries. And these two countries are escalating on the list of, uh, of being very uh, oppressive to Christians. Just last year, they said that China has jumped up 16 spots from 43 now to 26 within one year because of how they are uh, being uh, oppressive under Christians. Uh, India, for the first time in all of these 60 years that they have studied it, that India has moved to the top 10. It's on number 10. I mentioned that just a minute ago. In Hindu nationalists uh, are more hostile to Christians uh, than ever before. We have folks uh, in this church. We have folks in this church that have family members who were missionaries in India. And when they go into India, they cannot tell them they are there to be missionaries. They have to go in there Subvertly, and they have to go in under under a, some type of front as they're going to be businessmen or do something there. They have to go in and make relationships with the people in that community, and they have to be very careful who they tell Jesus about. Yeah. As a matter of fact, it has gotten so dangerous there that they have to be pulled out in the back of the states now. That's how bad India has got. So what I'm saying, I'm bringing some of these things up. We, may, we live in maybe live in our bubble, we may, and we not understand there are Christians, not thousands, not hundreds, there are millions of Christians living around the world in persecution because of their faith. And we may miss that. You may not see that on the evening news, but it's the truth. And because they're maybe so far away, because maybe they're out of sight and out of mind, many times we can lack compassion for these Christians. But I do want to remind you tonight, those are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes, they're going to be in heaven right beside us, amen, and they're truly blood-bought and washed in the blood of Jesus, amen. 1 Corinthians 2, 12, 26 says this, And if one member 
suffers, all the members suffer with it. And where one member is honored, then all the members rejoice with it. You know what? As Christian boys, it should burden us. It should bother us. There's almost two, oh, 245 million Christians living in persecution. What I want to encourage you to do is to pray for them. Amen. Yeah. To pray for them. Secondly, I tell you this tonight to show you how fortunate that you are. I tell you this tonight and just point out some of these things tonight to show you how fortunate you are that you have the opportunity to come to the house of God freely and so many neglect it. Amen. We have the opportunity to take up our Bibles and to read it. We have the opportunity to pray in public. We have the opportunity to talk about Jesus wherever we want to go. Oh, people may, they may jump on your throat. They may give blah, 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 this. Amen. But my goodness, they're not going to arrest you. They're not going to put you in jail. They're not going to threaten your life. Amen. We are blessed and we are fortunate to have the freedoms that we do in this country. But don't forget, there's many who don't have those freedoms. And we're very, we are blessed and we are fortunate to be in this place called America. Let us not forget the sufferings that are associated with the gospel. But also, let us not forget that that suffering can and will come home one day. I said, don't let us forget that that suffering can and will come home one day. Listen to John chapter 15. Let's go to John chapter 15 this evening. You guys on the screen, you can turn there if you want to. It says this, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world... But I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Now, why those Christians suffer? Because Jesus said, if they persecuted me, persecuted me literally for no reason, they're going to truly persecute you. A servant is not greater than his master. They will also persecute you. If they keep my word, they will also keep your word. If they listen to you, they'll listen, or they listen to me, they'll listen to you. If they, they, they rejected me, they're going to reject you. Christ suffered once and for all for our sins. But as I said as we began, Christ didn't do all of the suffering. Christ didn't do all of the suffering. He makes that clear right here in this text today. Christians, that we can be aware there's going to be some suffering as we carry the cross through this world. There's going to be some hardships that we face. There might be some persecution that we face. No, no, we might not face it in the way that some of these other countries do. I pray, I pray that God has mercy on the United States. But can I tell you something? I do believe this, that religious persecution is coming to the United States and it's coming very quickly if the church doesn't pray and we don't stand up, we don't vote, and we don't have a voice over some of these radicals uh, that are in office right now. Amen. I brought up that when I preached this, uh, uh, when I first started preaching First Peter, I talked about our religious freedoms and how they are under attack and how there was a bill that had just been recently uh, brought up in the House. And that it would literally, it would take uh, the LGBT and make them just as if they were a race. And if I was up here to talk against them, that would be considered racism. And it would be to the point that they would be silencing the church. I won't go into all the details of it, but I brought that up to you. We need to be mindful of this. And we, many times we have to, per, we may suffer for the church. We might not be martyrs today. But you know what? Yet yeah, we can be slandered. We can be ostracized for our faith. Have you ever been ostracized from your job? Somebody don't want to be around you. Somebody don't want to talk to you. I don't know if y'all get that, but I can tell you something right now about being a pastor. There are certain people that you can get around. They don't want to be around you, Brother George, do they? Daddy always tell you that. Daddy told me that before. You go around certain people. They, and and it's, it's almost like a light switch. They're one person, but then you walk up, they're a totally different person. And it don't take long, they want to get on away from you. And be, just simply because of your faith, because of your stance that you take from the Word of God, you can be treated differently. Amen. Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 
It says, but Paul writing this, but if you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering love, per perseverance, perse persecu persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch and at Chinon and Lystra, what persecutions I have endured. We read about Apostle Paul. He, he went through a lot. And out of them all, the Lord delivered me, though. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You see that? Amen. He said, if you want to truly live for Christ, it ain't necessarily going to be a cakewalk. Amen? That people are going to talk about you. They're going to slander you. They're going to uh, uh, ostracize you. They're going to treat you differently. We're going to face these things. So, so what is it? What is it we need to do, Pastor, when we're faced with persecution? We, we may not get, we may not uh, see it as greatly as other countries, but what are we to do when we're faced with persecution? What is it that other people should be doing when they face these things? I want to bring these things out that God laid on my heart and we bring it from the Scripture. Number one is this, latch on to the Scripture. I'm using some L's tonight, and that was the L word I found. Latch. Everybody say latch. Latch. Tax yourself, amen. Hold on. Latch yourself on to the scriptures. Listen to what Paul says continuing in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of knowing from whom you have learned them. Notice this, he says, evil is going to abound. The Word of God tells us, honestly, that persecution of the Christian will get worse, amen. But he says this right here, continue in the things that you've learned. Don't you leave no teaching. But he goes on to say this, and from the childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. He said, don't you depart from the Scriptures, amen. which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture, this is this famous verse we know well, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You listen to me. It doesn't matter what pressure that we face from the world. We must never forsake the Holy Scriptures. No matter what pressure we receive from the world, we do not need to forsake the Holy Scriptures. Somebody say amen. amen. I believe that we can take this verse right here that Tim, that Paul writes and we can connect it to that what the Apostle Paul says in chapter 3 that we read a minute ago when he says this, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Let's read that together. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, he says. Now, I want to say this and. I think you'll understand it. Christ and the Word are synonymous. Christ and the Word are synonymous. In other words, they're the same. Amen. What did the Bible say in John chapter word one that the Word, or excuse me, that the Word became what flesh? Amen. This Word tonight is a complete revelation of Jesus Christ from Genesis to Revelation. Honestly, it's about one person, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's the revelation of who He is. And Peter says, sanctify Christ in your hearts. And I also could say there, sanctify the Word in your hearts. Now, the God began speaking to me about this, a very simple understanding of, of what that means. Well, sanctify to start with means to set apart, to set apart. We are to sanctify the Word in our heart. It is to be set apart to, from everything else. This book right here that I hold in my hand, the Bible, the Word of God, can I tell you something that it should be set apart from every other book that's ever been written in history? It is to be set apart unto you above every other book that's ever been written in history. There is a progressive movement that is taking place right now around the world and right here in the United States. And that progressive movement, there are literally pastors because I have watched them preach. I listen to their teachings on this. There are preachers in pulpits where there are thousands of people in the congregation. And he said out of his own mouth, he said the Bible is an inspired book just like any other written book was inspired. 
that come out of the, this preacher's mouth and he's preaching to thousands of people and he tells them that the Word of God is just an inspired book just like any other book. Can I tell you something? That's a lie out of hell tonight. Amen. That's a lie out of hell. Don't you put this book on the same bookshelf, amen, as old Hemingway, as any of these Dick or Dickinson or Twain or Orwell or any of these self-help books that you've ever read. This Word of God ought to be set apart in your heart. It is greater. It is higher. It is stronger. It is living. It is more powerful than anything you'll ever pick up and you'll ever read. And we're trying to minimize the Word of God in this nation today. You need to sanctify the Word of God in your heart. It needs to be set apart above everything else. Amen. Amen. Don't you look at the Bible as being the same as some of these great works of Shakespeare. That's garbage. Amen. Let me tell you something. It's the Word of God that changes the soul. It's the Word of God that is the power unto salvation to all who believe upon it today. It's the Word of God that gives a lamp unto our feet and a light on our path. The Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, and it cuts to the soul of a man. Amen. This ain't in the same class as some other book. Is that self-help book that you got by Joel Osteen or somebody else? It ain't in the same class, friend. But we have taken the Word of God off the top shelf and we put it with everything else. We need to sanctify the Word of God in our hearts again. Amen? You know what? In many countries around the world, people are desperate for the Word of God. Yes. They're desperate for the Word of God. To have the opportunity to pick up a Bible and read it. And yet in America, we are so blessed. We've got so many churches. We have so many Bibles laying around that we've become apathetic towards the Word of God and uninterested in the Gospel. Jesus lives on our coffee tables more than He does in our hearts. And as a result, we see it in this country today. Churches and pastors are turning from the true gospel because of worldly pressure. Churches and pastors and Christians are turning from the true gospel because of worldly pressure. They're bowing to political correctness of our time instead of taking a firm stand. The biggest reason is, oh, they don't offend anybody. But the real bottom line is they have not sanctified the Word of God in their hearts. They have not said, this is the truth. They have not come, and they have not made it up in their mind and their hearts and said, this is the infallible, inerrant Word of God. And therefore, because of political correctness and pressure from the world, guess what they're doing? They're saying, well, this is just a book written by man. Oh, we, 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 things change and culture change. So some of those things just don't apply to us. What did that verse say we read just a minute ago in Timothy? It said that all Scripture, all Scripture is profitable for us. Yes. Amen. Amen. Amen? Sanctify the Word of God in your heart again. This was not written by man. This was not written by men. It was written by the Holy Spirit of God that moved upon them and they wrote down these words for you and I. Amen. This is the precious Word of God. Amen. Yes, amen. I pray tonight that you uphold it in that manner. That when it don't matter, this is always the foundation which we should stand upon. Amen. This is the source of right, right here. This is the source of right, the Word of God. We ought to sanctify the Word of God in our hearts. You know what, Sam? We'll go back and we need to sanctify Christ in our hearts. Yes, we need to sanctify Christ in our hearts. We need to set Him apart. When the disciples, when the disciples, excuse me, when Jesus asked the disciples, I believe it's Matthew 16, I believe, He asked them, Who do men say that I am? Who, do, who does everybody else say that I am? And, they said this. Some say you're a prophet. Some say you're Elijah. We get we get right on that. Well, so and so said you're a good teacher. So and so said you're a good example for other people. You're a good man. Other people say that you're a lunatic, that you're a liar, that you're crazy. But 
But this is the thing. Jesus was not just a prophet. Jesus was, is not just a man. He's not just a teacher, a good teacher, or a good man, or a prophet. And he surely is not a liar nor a lunatic, but Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. Amen. He is not just any other man tonight. He's not just any other great man of history. He's not some, some, somebody that just come along and change it. took that stand for Jesus and that he was martyred. 
I was listening to this and reading it. It was just amazing to me. Years later, the same chief of this group that had oversaw this killing of him. See, when that man took that stand for that, I believe there was a seed planted. Just like when Stephen, the very first martyr of Christians, recorded in the Bible. We're going to read it in a minute. When he was martyred, there was a seed, I believe, planted in the, the heart of Paul or Saul as he stood there and overwatched him. But years later, the man that oversaw the killing of these that were in India, he renounced that religion that he was under, and he claimed that Jesus Christ was the way, the truth, and the life. And he said it all went back to when he saw that man stand there and watch his children die, and his wife die, and even himself. He said, that man knew something that I didn't know. And he said, but for that man to stand the way that he did, he said, I know it had to be real. Amen. Sanctify Amen. Christ in your hearts. Amen. Set him apart above from everything else. Set the word of God apart from everything else, church. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me move on quickly. I'm out of time. Amen. <laughs> is Christ sanctified in your heart? If he's not, pick up this word of God and get in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me go through the next two quickly. It is 8 o'clock. I, I try and be respectful. I know you've got to go to work tomorrow. Number two, when we face persecution, we want to latch on to the scripture. I said, secondly, love anyway. Love anyway. When the world persecutes you as a Christian, how in the world should we respond? The Apostle Peter makes it clear. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Finally, all of you, be in one mind, having compassion for one another, loving as brothers, be tender-hearted, being courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Verse chapter, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 8, he says this, Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Yes, Lord. You can go and read the one in 1 John. I won't take the time to do it. But these scriptures tell us this, under persecution, to love anyway. Say that with me. To love, love anyway. anyway. Yes, the best example that I can give you comes from the very first martyr. Very first martyr after Christ for the, for the Christian faith, and his name was Stephen. In Acts chapter 7, this is what the Bible says. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Hallelujah. Man, in order... To say what he was initially, what he really was saying is, Lord, forgive them. Mm -hmm. As they are stoning him, understand, as the rocks are hitting him in the side of the head, he cries out, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. Lord, forgive them. Was he not showing the love and grace of Christ yes. even yes. in the last moments of his death as he's being persecuted? Let me tell you something. That takes a lot of Jesus in you to do that. Yes. Yes. We get mad at somebody at Walmart when they cut us off. <laughs> and we get ready to fight them, amen, because they took our spot in line. Amen. I like to watch these. I like to watch. I told you sometimes I'll get caught up watching these YouTube videos. And one of them I like is road rage. And you watch these videos, somebody will cut them off. And then they'll, they'll get to the red light and they jump out of the car and they fight one another. They're hitting their car with a bat. Amen. We'll lose it. Over these little old things. And Stephen showed the love of Christ in the last moments of his life as he's being pelted with rocks. He said, Lord, forgive them. Yes. Man. You want to know why he could say that? Because he had Christ sanctified in his heart. Amen. He had the word of God sanctified in his heart. I'm encouraged. Love anyone. Even when they persecute. Even when they revile you. Even... even even when they may martyr us, you know what? Show them love anyway. You know what it'll do? It'll blow their mind. Amen. Let me move on quickly. Let's go to the third one. Number three, look ahead. When we face persecution, latch on to the scriptures. Yes, Lord. I'm going to love anyway. 
Look, lastly, look ahead. Over the last 2,000 years, I believe millions, thousands, millions of Christians have suffered, suffered for the cause of Christ. But do you know what they had? They had something waiting on them. It was called eternal life. It was called eternal life. That means that God transformed their sufferings, their pain, and He turned it into glory and great joy. It's kind of like the mother that Jesus talks about in John chapter 16. Listen, y'all be coming on to the music because I'm done. And a woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she gives birth to that child, she no longer remembers that anguish for the joy of that human being is being born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow. Listen to this. But I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy, no, excuse me, and your joy, no one will take from you. Amen. For when we suffer for the cause of Christ, we need to be mindful of this. We need to know that what we're going through is just temporary. How are these folks around the world enduring? Of course, they got Christ sanctified in their heart. They love Him anyway. But they also know that this world is not our home. We're just passing through here, folks. We've got something greater, and we've got something so much better to look forward to. Amen. Listen to these two blast beatitudes, and we'll close. Matthew 5 says this, Blessed are those who are persecuted for the righteous sake, for theirs is the kingdom of what? Heaven. Amen. I'll take a little bit of suffering. I'll take suffering if I can get to heaven. Amen. Mm -hmm. I'd rather suffer here. I'd rather suffer here. Amen. And go to heaven than to dwell with the world and go to hell. Amen. Mm -hmm. Lastly, he says it again in Luke. He says, Blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and cast you out for my brother. <coughs> For your name's sake as evil, for the man of, son of man's name's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in a like manner the, the fathers did to the prophets. He said it ain't nothing new. They did it to the prophets, they'll do it to you. Will you stand on your feet all over the house? You've heard the word tonight, Amen. Most important part of this sermon, I believe this, is that you sanctify Christ within your hearts. Amen. You uphold Him above anything and everything else tonight. You know what? Those statistics tell us that persecution is on the rise around the world. The devil is going to do everything that he can to snuff out the children of God and snuff out the church. But I'm reminded of what my Lord said, and he said this, the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. Amen. Amen. It don't matter what we go through. It don't matter what they try and do. Let me tell you something. We are overcomers in Christ Jesus. Amen. And we may have to endure a little bit right here, but I'm telling you right now, we've got something so much greater to look forward to. Amen. Amen. As we begin to sing, if they get ready, come on and begin to sing. The altar's open. We never close without an altar call. Is there something you need to pray about? Something that God spoke to you about as I've been preaching when you come this evening as we sing and as we pray? Your name.